call this uh, hearing of the Transportation Committee to order. Uh, we'll start with uh, roll call. Uh, Mr. Weddleton, can you start? John Weddleton. Suzanne Lamar. Forrest Dunbar. Peggy Peterson. Lisa Sluzner. Dean Gates is in the council. Okay, thank you. We're just going to have people. Uh, oh, actually, Eric, could you identify yourself for us? Well, Eric Lusher is transportation and effective. Okay, great. Um, so I, uh, I'll, I'll do the introduction first, then we'll have Dean start working through this. Uh, let me start by saying this is, uh, you can see by the watermark, this is a, a first draft of a very large and complicated ordinance that I think is going to take uh, quite a lot of time to work through. Um, this was a result of discussions I had with uh, people in the dispatch industry, people I had that were medallion holders, um, members of the public. Um, some conversation with Eric, although I'm sure not as many as he would have liked. Uh, and then working with uh, Assembly Council Dean Gates. Um, and I, I realize for everybody that just literally just got this in their hands. So there, I'm sure there are a lot of things in here that uh, people are displeased with and maybe want to see removed or strengthened. And it's going to be an ongoing discussion. So um, this is by no means set in stone. Uh, and we're going to have this discussion. Uh, the overriding uh, goals of this uh, this ordinance, I think, are articulated pretty well um, by uh, Mr. Gates in the whereases uh, to this to this ordinance, um, and there will eventually be a, a memorandum as well. Uh, but basically, last year we made a fairly large change to the taxi industry through um, an ordinance sponsored by Mr. Evans, who I'm a little bit upset with, is no longer on the body to, to work on this stuff now. Um, but so he, he put forward this ordinance that we approved that changed the number of medallions uh, or number of permits uh, in, the, uh, in the taxi industry, made a few other changes as well. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, because to a change to state law, um, transportation network companies were allowed to uh, begin operations in Anchorage. Uh, and it was written in such a way that it took away our local control. And so the TNC ordinance that we had also worked on that had some form of regulation on the, uh, on the TNCs was obviated and overridden by that state law. Uh, and so this ordinance is an attempt to partially uh, uh, address some of those issues uh, and try to uh, continue to modernize uh, this industry and deal with some of those challenges. Uh, so with that, uh, unless there are some initial questions from my colleagues, I would ask that Mr. Uh, Gates begin the process of walking through this ordinance. Is there anything that anyone else wants to say or questions before we get started with that? Yeah, Mr. Weddleton? So you said you talked to people in the industry and others. Did you um, yep. draw from like the letter? Uh, Mr. Gates can speak to that, but I know he has looked uh, at some other cities and, and, and their uh, their laws. Some of the language in here was taken directly from the state law with, with regard to TNCs, uh, and I know that the TNCs laws were taken from other states. So in some cases, he changed the regulations for taxis so that they are equivalent now to the state law on TNCs. Uh, and to me, that you know, gets to questions of fairness, basically, um, and also the ability of the, the taxi industry to uh, to survive uh, with this new competition. Thank you for the question. Any others? Okay. Uh, with that, so I, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Gates. If we can start walking okay. through this. Sure. And. Um, before I do, I noticed that we're out of copies for the public, oh. so I want to see, I can have some more printed right now. Yeah, can we do uh, that How please? many more copies do we need? Who needs a copy of the draft ordinance? Just one? Two, two. more? Two more? We'll make about five more copies. Oh yeah, so we have a couple that, I don't know if our colleagues are coming back or if they're not, um, but we have a few more copies right here, but yeah, if we can get those printed, so if our colleagues would turn that to great. Okay. Um, so we'll continue downstairs now. It's on our printer now. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, so, all right, as Mr. Uh, Chair Dunbar mentioned, the whereas clauses are here and pretty much explain what the objectives are of this ordinance, modernize and update our tax code, making a level playing field with the transportation services market. So, on page one, the first thing you'll notice, and I guess I should say this at the opening, uh, let me know if I need to speak up. Sometimes my voice falters off. And secondly, this is legislative drafting style in this document. So everything that's underlined is new language that's being added. Everything in brackets that's capitalized is being deleted from the current code. Uh, so that said, at the bottom, we have a new definition um, for curbside service. Um, this definition is intended to distinguish a flag drop fare from other types of fares which are uh, solicited or procured from an app or um, in another way. So uh, basically, um, curbside service, you fly it down a cab and you don't have the opportunity to uh, compare the different taxi cab rates and services out there. And you'll see that definition used a few other places. I mean, you'll see the term used a few other places. So page two, um, in the 11.10.30a, there's a new phrase added, which basically just is a statement of a uh, fact statement of uh, uh, if um, the municipality is preempted from regulating a certain type of transportation service, then we're preempted. That's all it says. Uh, page 3 in 11.10.50, here's uh, a very major change to um, the regulation of different types of rates. Right now, the tax uh, Anchorage Transportation Commission can set maximum rates to be charged for tax cap service. But now we've changed that to only uh, regulating maximum rate for curbside service. And that means uh, it's not regulating rates that are procured through a digital dispatch app or other means, phone calls. So only curbside service will have a maximum rate. And you'll see later that it's the same as currently. We aren't changing the $3 flag drop and 30 cents per tenth mile rate. That's still in place as the uh, commission that set it before. So uh, that's the second change there is deleting dispatch service rates. Those aren't going to be regulated anymore. Um, the rates for vehicles for hire are going to be well, there's just a method for the commission to establish where you would improve them rather than actually improving the rates. And then you see the deletion of uh, the um, rate regulation, basically giving the municipality out of the price fixing business, I guess we could say. Um, so in B, we have in a new subsection B2 at the bottom of page three, this allows a dynamic um, rate to be applied to meet market demand, similar to surge pricing and so forth up to 20%, whatever the applicable regular rate is. Um, so page four, we got um, some new language in subsection F. Uh, this is basically to refer to uh, the rates that are established by a dispatch service company and um, basically prohibit um, charging different rates uh, that taxi cab chauffeur than the dispatch company that they subscribe to is set. It also allows fares to be prepaid and some rules for saying, well, even if it's a prepaid fare, you have to apply the rate that's established already. You can't, you know, just boost it up because it's prepaid and you need to credit the person or refund the excess and so forth. Dean, can I uh, interrupt you for a yes, second? Sir. So um, I think we kind of, we went a little bit quickly through that, but just to reiterate, uh, trying to get the city out of the business of price fixing where we felt practical. And also, a, a lot of this ordinance also is trying to address um, things that members of the industry have told us about with these um, things called, uh, 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 shoot, what's it called? The, these digital services they can use um, that are sort of similar to Uber and Lyft, but different. Um, i trying to think, what was the name of one of them? Uh, the apps that cabs can use. Um, um, like Dash Ride, Dash Ride Curb. Things like that to allow, to allow them to use uh, these alternative uh, ways to, uh, to do dispatch. Okay, sorry, Thank you. sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No problem, please interrupt any time for some clarification or questions. So, uh, it's a long document, so I don't want to hold questions to the end. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. 
So in 11.10.80, I think that's where I left off. This is uh, related to vehicle inspections. And there's two big changes here. One is uh, changing the frequency of inspections. Instead of twice in, it's just once in, and, or when uh, the vehicle has 10,000 miles. And secondly, with vehicles that are older and have over 200,000 miles on them, the uh, inspections are, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, two inspections in, we are at least once every 5,000 miles, so just twice as often as uh, other vehicles. And addition, sorry, here we have. Yes, Mr. Webb. Oh, yes. Uh, 10,000 miles. Uh, I think that, was, that there, I was in there. Yeah, that that's existing. That's the existing standard is ten thousand miles. I don't like it. I don't like it. What's that? Annually. <laughs> yeah, that that's the existing. Uh, that's the existing standard. Uh, certainly, if I think that uh, upping the that number would be something that I think. Some members of the industry would support. Mr. Messer, do you want to speak to that? Is 10,000 miles still a, a useful standard? I mean, vehicles have changed a lot in the last 20 years. Um, well, actually, it's pretty low because a, a, a vehicle operating full time average 10,000 miles a month. Oh, wow. Uh, so we so, could. So the way the, the title recommended <coughs> read was that we, we sort of went uh, on page five on the B. If, if a vehicle, other than a limousine, a vehicle for hire, uh, that was once a year, annually, or 10,000 miles. The cabs were under 200,000. Um, uh, they uh, were expected quarterly, um, over to, uh, uh, semi-annual, right. less than 200,000, quarterly, over 200,000. Right. Um, so maybe we should... Uh, add zero? <laughs> or just get rid of that portion of it, if that's what you're talking about. If, if so below, so it used to be quarterly. What I'm doing basically is reducing it from, uh, you know, under 200,000 used to be twice a year. I'm reducing it to once a year. Over 200,000 used to be four times a year. I'm reducing it twice a year. And then we can just get rid of talk of 10,000. I assume that you could still do some kind of forecast check regardless, right? Um, well, we did. We just, uh, IT just reprogrammed our computer on the 27th. We were able to administratively adjust the frequency of those inspections because Title 11 gives us safety oversight for field checking and things yeah. like that. And I don't think this changes that. So, and it, no, it doesn't. And okay. so, so we, we just really beginning come January, we just lowered that frequency. Okay, so uh, for Dean, could you please take out that 10,000 mile requirement then? And we'll, uh, sure. we'll uh, talk in the future if there is some more appropriate number we can find, but for now, let's just take it out. Should we also take out the 5,000 in yes. B? Okay. And I would say that there's also the reasonable cost inspections aren't changed. That's still in uh, this code, current code and this draft. That's not being affected. Okay. Um, so, and then the other uh, main change to this section is uh, the inspections can be conducted by a licensed and certified mechanic. So uh, currently, code has an inspection program. The vendor selected by the transportation inspector that uh, all the regulated vehicles need to go to, and this just removes that, and so, uh, they can go to any licensed certified mechanic who needs to have that checklist in 1180 subsection E, which has a list of about 20 four items to check for for safety. So, and that's that's an, a large change to the section. Okay, um, so page um, five, the changes at the bottom in E are just to make this consistent with the changes to tax meter language that we'll get to later. And uh, the operational radio identifier uh, is just being removed because that would be checked by um, the TI, not the licensed certified mechanic who's familiar with vehicles, maybe not radio communications. So that's where that's taken up. So the next section, 111085, is drug and alcohol testing. So uh, on page five to the top of page six, um, the main thing, the main change here is um, 
there were four types of drug and alcohol tests. One's uh, a screening test when someone first applies, and that's being removed. Uh, similar to TNC drivers that have no pre-application screening test. Uh, so we're taking that out here as well for chauffeurs. But we still have the um, uh, we still have the other tests: reasonable cause, post-accident, and post-citation drug and alcohol tests. So those stay in place. Um, the other main change you'll see at the bottom of page six is uh, taking out the design, cost structure, and fee determination. Uh, that program that's set by the uh, TI and the commission. So instead, um, if you get C, the uh, chauffeur can go to any uh, business that complies with the Department of Transportation regulations for drug alcohol testing and get their drug alcohol test there. So I can imagine BPM, WorkSafe, any of those businesses that meet that type of standard can perform a drug and alcohol test required and then we have the results reported to the TL. So um, I guess moving on, on page seven, we've got uh, the denial of suspension revocation section 11, 10, 110. So in uh, actions against permits, we're taking out uh, the language that says a permit will lapse or expire if it isn't used within uh, 45 consecutive days or 90 days in a 12 month period and so forth. So there's no time limitation on not using a tax cut permit. And uh, there is though a natural lapse. If uh, it's an annual permit, it's renewed annually. So if someone doesn't use their permit for a year, it comes up for renewal, they don't pay the renewal fee, um, then it expires. And they pay the renewal fee and don't use it. I mean, you're free to spend your money on a permit fee that you're not using, I suppose. So can I interrupt there, Dean, just to explain to my colleagues. So back when there were a very finite number of permits, we had requirements like this to make sure a lot of these permits were on the road. But now there are both a number, lot of permits, and beyond that, there is the TNCs. Uh, so if someone were to purchase a bunch of permits and not use them, uh, it wouldn't mean that there were no services in town. Uh, it means that people would use other services. So this is sort of acknowledging that. Now there might be legitimate reasons why a permit holder doesn't can't doesn't want to or can't operate a permit for a period of time. And this is saying that's fine if they want to pay the fee for a permit and hold the permit and not use it. Um, we're no longer going to take away their permit for doing so um, because because I I believe there are now alternatives. Uh, that make that not a rational market decision. Okay. It's good. Can you, can you I, I'm sorry, sir. We've got to get through this, and it's a it's a hearing. If, if there's time at the end, and definitely, and just to for everybody in the audience, this is not going to be the the last one. We have lots of chances for you. Spend money on this business, so the meeting should be go with the permit owner, which are right or wrong those laws. We, we don't agree to a lot of things given on giving, you know. Okay, uh, sir, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to have to keep going. Okay. Mr. Mr. Okay. Go ahead, Dean. Oh, thank you. So, uh, so on page 7, we went over that action against permits, no time limitation on the use of the permit. Um, let's see, page 8 at the bottom uh, is related to dispatch service. Uh, actions against dispatch licenses. Uh, very similarly, taking out time limitation requirements on use of the license. Um, oh, page nine, uh, 11, 10, 140, uh, for the renewal application, uh, subsection E is being deleted. That basically is just uh, consistent with removal of the program um, for a chauffeur training program, which is being removed. And we'll get to that a little later, but the chauffeur training program is established for a knowledge of the Title 11 and the streets and safety and so forth. And it's established and then up TI, gives space for that, um, uh, that training and examination at the end show for us to pass. That whole program is being deleted. So basically, if you can pass your uh, driver's license test and get state driver's license, you can drive. Um, is that right? Yeah, and, and I think it's the next page so we can have that longer discussion. So, you know, to be an Uber or Lyft driver, you don't have to go through any special training. 
you have to prove you can drive safely on our roads, which means getting a driver's license. And after that, they have internal, yeah, Mr. Wellman, they have internal standards and market standards, and they will do whatever they do. And so this basically tries to even, uh, even the playing field in the same way. That is to say, um, if you want to drive a taxi cab, you have to maintain a valid driver's license. And beyond that, the requirements, the, you know, how good you are at driving our streets will be established by the people that actually run these businesses. And if a driver is terrible, I'd assume that they would lose their job. Um, but we're not going to create, in, in this version, we're not going to create a special program administered by the government that makes you learn things about, um, you know, our streets and that kind of thing. Um, yes, Mr. Wildman. Well, you know, that's probably okay. I think just one thing for the, in a way, I think for a taxi to survive, they need to be elevated. Like, that's your premium service. And it's your goal here is to rely on Yellow Cab has to create that brand. Yeah, I mean, Yellow Cab or Checker Cab or perhaps the, the permit holders that allow people to drive on their permit. Um, but, you know, I, I'll use your case. We don't have a government program to require you to have people know about comic books, right? What you there should be. Yeah. We don't have requirements that people, you know, we don't have government programs that require you to do training to, to work in your store. Because we rely on you to provide that kind of quality control. And that's what we've said that is okay for Uber and Lyft. And I want to give the taxi companies that same opportunity. Yeah, I understand that. But, you know, there is a difference <coughs> that we heard last year doing this, but um, yeah. you are going into this vehicle with someone. So I have a choice if I go to a new city. It's like I got Uber and Lyft, I'm like, about those people. But I'm pretty confident that because they have higher standards for taxi, this may not be true. I don't know. That's been my perception. Yeah. So I'm actually, it's not that big a deal. I'll take a taxi because I trust it a little bit more. And I don't, and I think as it's evolved, we've learned from the industry, you know, where what works best for them to say, hey, we're a notch above. Yeah, and that, that, that might be it. I mean, so uh, my example is uh, growing up in Cordova, we had the Cordova District Fishermen's United made a decision that Copper River salmon was going to mean a certain thing, and they have self-imposed quality control within the industry. It wasn't forced by government. They just said, when you get Copper River salmon, you're going to know it's of a certain quality, and we're going to do that together as a, as a fishing fleet, basically. We're going to put things on ice immediately. And so the question will be, who is a better arbiter of that? Is it the government or is it the industry? And maybe the industry will actually decide that the government is better because then everybody has to go by the same uh, rules. But that, that'll be a discussion that we have going forward. I guess my point is I'm open to that if, if they need it. Mr. Steele, well, posted you know? rating system or something, you know, that, that the company basically, uh, the drivers have to read a certain standard, whether it's a safety standard or yeah. training standard or whatever, a knowledge standard. Uh, but uh, we, we, the public, have to uh, have to be secure in the knowledge that these are qualified people. Or right. My, my assertion so basically is that we yeah, are they are qualified in the sense that they have a driver's license. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> at least that minimum amount of safety and security is what we require everybody to be on the road. So um, that's a low bar. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. Boy, that's a wide uh, bar. Yeah. If you can, can you, Mr. Gates. I would uh, add that um, the vehicles that chauffeurs are driving, you know, they have a capacity limitation. I think it's uh, seven or under capacity. Six or under capacity. So these aren't like buses and vehicles where you maybe have more safety concerns how someone drives it. These are regular type vehicles in terms of size and weight and so forth that anybody with a driver's license is able to drive. So, uh, let's see. So I'm um, jumping back in here on page 10 at the top, uh, there's a language change and it relates to um, uh, I'm sorry, what page fees are for inspection, certification, and other approved. I'm sorry, what page are we on uh, Yeah, I was going to page 10. Okay, I just finished you. page 9, the training program. So the bottom of page nine is about fees and uh, we're taking some language in subsection four at the top of ten. Uh, this additional language of the taximeter just accommodates the traditional mechanical taximeters and the new language certification or other inspection certification of 
a software-based taximeter, uh, which is a new, um, I guess there's a new standard that was just addressed last summer by the National Conference on Weights and Measures on certifying taximeters of their software-based or GPS location services space, and that just accommodates that. Um, let's see. We're also taking out the uh, fee for vehicle inspections because we're no longer requiring them to be administered by the TI and the uh, selected vendor. So let's see. Uh, next, we have section two for uh, the permits, chapter 1120. So at the bottom of page 10, uh, we're taking out the requirement that the permit owner um, intend to participate in the maintenance of the chauffeur training program. So it relates to that uh, program I just talked about. So a permit owner doesn't need to subscribe to that, and nor at the top of page 11. Uh, oh, that's the TI making available the program at a certain site. So that's what that deletion is about. The new language just basically makes the permit owner responsible for their chauffeurs who drive their permitted vehicle and their expertise, the quality of the service the chauffeurs provide. Um, let's see, the middle of page 11 is just a kind of clean up language amendment. So um, page 12, we have the issuance of a permit. Uh, some of this is a new program uh, or the new approach to issuing permits. We have a five-year phase in Korea uh, that you all are aware of. All the language is omitted. But there's some new language here in A2. It's uh, basically saying that the evidence that needs to be presented that market reconciliation hearing should include the um, call volumes, response times, so we're able to determine the impact of uh, adding additional permits to the system. Uh, this hearing, though, won't happen until 2021. So that's something that uh, will affect the future process. Uh, let's see. Page 13, um, at the bottom of the top, it uh, simply makes um, the determination to reissue permits that had no responsive bidder up to the commission instead of the transportation inspector. So uh, the inspector could go to the commission and say we have permits that weren't awarded to any successful bid, which will be issued now until next year. Um, let's see. So the middle of page 13, uh, we have new language, uh, monthly idling of vehicles. Um, so this was a request from the industry that sometimes, uh, I mean, summer's busy, winter's slow, maybe they want to suspend the use of the permit and uh, park the vehicle for a month or two, you know, as part of their business expense, you know, considerations. And um, this language pretty much uh, authorizes that to be done. And you'll see language later that also says the uh, payment for the dispatch service subscription can be suspended on those months when uh, the permit is idled, and as well as the insurance coverage that can be suspended those months the the vehicles idled. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought I saw a hand up. Okay. okay. No. So um, moving on, then uh, the bottom of page 13, 11, 20, 70, about vehicle markings, and it continues to page 14. Uh, this is basically to clarify that vehicle markings don't need to be um, the full vehicle coverage. They just need to be um, reasonably conspicuous following the color scheme of the dispatch service they subscribe to uh, the markings, colors, or other visible indi indication. So I guess traditionally, people have seen taxi cabs as all yellow, um, the whole vehicle is marked some way. This pretty much accommodates allowing the smaller markings on the vehicle, for example. Um, there's additional language that I think just clarifies to subsection B on page 14. Uh, subsection C also adds dispatch equipment to uh, the use of a vehicle that's being put out of service and removing all this equipment. Also remove the dispatch equipment. Uh, subsection D here uh, 
is about markings that have to be on the vehicle or those of the dispatch service it subscribes to. Um, so moving on, 11, 20, 80 at the bottom of 14. Um, <coughs> this clarifies that, and we'll see this in other sections later, um, the permitted taxi cab must have either the, um, I'm sorry, dispatch system that's a two-way radio or the GPS computer-based system. And then in addition, you can have digital dispatch app. So you have to have one of those two. You can also add in digital dispatch app as part of the dispatch services. Um, yes, sir. You're on this uh, section A, bottom of 14. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, only one radio frequency, is that so that they don't uh, kind of pirate the other guy's fares? Uh, yeah, that's already in current code, and that's a little more clearer in Chapter 1140 about dispatch services. And uh, that's still in place where uh, radio frequency assigned to a dispatch <coughs> service can't be used by the other dispatch services or their drivers, so they can't spy on each other's calls. And um, Mr. Messer is probably more familiar with how that works technically. Would they jump on each other's fares? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they can, they can without, without unique identifiers, they do they glom on each other. Yeah. It, it, it still comes back with some of the others when they were radio dispatched. No honor in this <laughs> what, There's no honor in this No. Desperation. <laughs> That's right. This is money we're talking about. The same amount of honor in this industry as every other. Yeah, That's right. That's just, it is what it is. Mr. <laughs> Okay, so um, moving on, I guess we're on page 15, uh, going towards the middle of subsection D. Uh, <coughs> this also adds language about the tax meter, approved meter and application, which would uh, mean a GPS-based, software-based uh, tax meter system. Uh, it adds language about campering without meter and applications. So we don't have language about campering with the traditional tax meter. Um, it will be interesting to see how that's all implemented. Uh, subsection E is just more clarification with other changes about the silent alarm system. Um, so it's the silent alarm system currently supposed to work with the radio, but we're changing to the dispatch system, whichever dispatch system is installed and used. Um, it also allows uh, Silent alarm signal to be sent directly to the emergency center of the municipality. Uh, I think, Mr. Waddle Team? Yes, Mr. Waddle Team. Is, uh, <coughs> sorry, is our 911 dispatch able to, I mean, would this be like an electronic signal? They hit a panic button and that automatically calls 911? Are, are we, does that work? Um, well, you know, we have an alarm registration code and I, and actually, that's a detail I should investigate further. I think that's how uh, registration of alarms work. I think this would probably work the same way as an alarm that's registered. Like a building with a registered alarm system, and if it's tripped, it automatically sends a signal to so. dispatch center. No, because I have a couple, I have a, I have a fire alarm, and I have security alarms in my business, and it goes to a dispatch, you know, kind of a company that then makes a decision on whether or not to call APD. And I have them call mm -hmm. me first before they call, or I could default to they call APD right away. If they can't get in touch mm -hmm. with me, they call APD, but it doesn't go straight to um, APD. And my license, whatever all the rules are, I call them. I appreciate the comment. Well, I appreciate the comment. As I said, I think this is an area that needs a little more work investigation as to whether that would work. So I think the last phrase is questionable. Okay. So that's why I have draft all over this document. <laughs> um, so at the bottom of page 15, I have 11, 20, 90, certification and ceiling of taxing equipment. And um, I 
touched on this a few times. The change to that section is just to accommodate uh, the division of weights and measures and the new uh, uh, amendments they had to what's called handbook 44 for um, certifying and uh, uh, inspecting this software based tax meter that uses GPS certification services. And uh, I have some information on that. I'm happy to make available. Subsection C that's added basically uh, just a subscription of that type of system, that type of tax meter system. So uh, there's many cities across the U.S. that are moving to that type of taximeter and removing the requirement for a mechanical, traditional mechanical taximeter. Uh, so on the bottom of page 16, um, the addition to subsection 1120-100D is basically in line with suspending service. I don't need a permit allowing the uh, insurance to be suspended. Uh, that would require prior notice. In another section, you see that uh, prior notice of the intent to idle a permit is uh, got to be uh, not more than 21 days and not less than five days prior to the calendar month that the vehicle will be idled. So, and that's a policy call there. So let's see. Uh, the top of page 17 is also in line with that change. Um, I've got here on page 17, 11, 20, 120 is records of service. Uh, this is about the trip sheet that chauffeurs maintain. And the additional language to A5 is basically to recognize that the digital dispatch system or the electronic system might already have this information so it's not requiring the information listed here to be written on the trip sheet. So, and that is, of course, so for two discussion. So at the bottom of page 17, uh, subsection B says a, um, the records that are retained by tax cabs, the permits, it doesn't have to be residents of Alaska, uh, resident or domiciled in the United States. So, uh, so uh, Dean, is this a good Dean? Dean is this a good yes, sort of time to talk about that broader policy change about going from just Alaska to allowing dispatch employees or, or to to live when, or or the headquarters of the digital dispatch to be anywhere in the United States, or is that later on? Um, that's on page twenty-three. Okay, we'll, um, we'll wait a minute for that. Excuse then. me. Okay. Um, so page 18, uh, 11, 20, is being repealed. It's the chauffeur training program I mentioned earlier. So, um, section three for uh, chapter 11, 30 about the chauffeurs, chauffeur's licensing. Uh, so this is a main change to subsection 11, 30, 20 B. Uh, currently, you have a fingerprint-based background check required, and the change here to B3 uh, basically splits this into little A, little B on page 19, and A is the same fingerprint-based background check. It has a little clarifying amendments that also includes the driving history. Little B in the middle of page 19 on line 28 is um, allowing a third-party primary source locator service background check which is the same background check that uh, the state adopted in its uh, TNC bill for TNC drivers. So basically here, a chauffeur's uh, background check can be either a fingerprint or uh, the same background check that TNC drivers get. So we have that option for either type of background check. Which is what? Um, let's see. Uh, page nine. Yeah. I know. I'm, I mean, I'm, I thought he was looking at me. Wait, what is it's a it's a third party a third party primary source locator background check that shall be local and national in scope and review. So it's the same uh, standard adopted by the state. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so page 19, another change here to the chauffeur's licensing application is uh, paragraph 4, line 35 is deleted. There's um, currently a physical examination and a certificate for the licensed physician is required and that's be removed. Yeah, and this is just a straight policy call on my case, uh, my choice, and we can have this discussion. Um, basically, chauffeurs have to go out and get an inspect uh, a physical before they start working now, and that is that can be time consuming and expensive, and we don't require that of a lot of other industries. If you go work in food services, for example, you don't have to go and prove that if you don't pass a physical. Um, and so this is a discussion we can have. But I, I remove the physical requirement. Um, if I was an employer, I'd still want to employ someone that, you know, could drive a car without crashing it, um, because that would dramatically impact my business. Um, this would remove that requirement for a government-issued chauffeur's license. Yep. But there's nothing to prevent uh, promoters or dispatch service from saying you have some kind of standard for their business. Is that right? So, thank you. Uh, it's also at the bottom of page 19 is for the chauffeur's license application is removing the requirement to demonstrate uh, the ability to read, write, and speak the English language. Uh, then at the bottom is to even subsection C, uh, which relates to the um, Commission approved course of study that we talked about earlier. So the knowledge, the study, and knowledge of Title 11 and safety and so forth. Um, at page 20, of the deletion of subsection D is similar uh, for the same reason. And then at the bottom of page 20, deleting subsection F is uh, upon renewal of the SOFRS license, the two-year re renewal uh, refresher course being required. It deletes that as well, similar to the um, chauffeur training course in uh, C and D. Okay, so um, we're going to the issuance of the chauffeur's license on page 21. Um, here we have the background check already submitted, and now the uh, transportation inspector determines whether to issue the license or not. And here looking at the background check, there's time frames changed here. In uh, on page 21, subsection B, on the nine changes at 12 months to the past three years, and then on subsection E, line 31, it changes five years to the past seven years. Uh, this makes these two and the list of those offenses the same as what's in the state law now for TNC drivers. So it's just leveling the playing field for what disqualifies someone to drive in terms of their background in the To be clear, this makes it stricter, which is what they did at the state level. They make the look back from the last 12 months to the last three years. Um, a couple other changes too, but this is one case where things are more stringent on the chauffeurs just as the state made them more stringent on TNC drivers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, some other language that's added here is just for consistency and clarification. It's on page 21. So page 22, um, going to section 1130, 140. Oh, this is the text capture for records, and this is sort of in line with changes about recording on the trip sheet. Uh, subsection B um, distinguishes between a digital dispatch system or software based reviewing system that already electronically records this information that must be in records. And if it's not equipped with that, then the information uh, needs to be entered on the system. So it's subsection C is uh, similarly, um, and that's about uh, making sure the information is entered on the system if the electronic system is used. Um, in the top of page 23, it uh, specifies the information for trips documented by the application of digital dispatch or retained by the dispatch company under chapter 1140. 
Um, so next section four about uh, dispatch companies and the dispatch services. We have a bunch of changes here at 114020. Uh, the application for dispatch service uh, here in subsection B, B2 has, uh, I think someone asked about that earlier, Mr. Walton, uh, being able to show that the dispatch service has an FCC license for radio communications <coughs> or that they use a computerized dispatch system approved by the Transportation Inspector, which is a GPS-based computer system. Um, and number three, so a dispatch service has to have one of those. Um, then number three, B3, say you can also have a digital dispatch system to supplement one of those other two systems. Um, it only if that digital dispatch system, such as Dash Ride or Curb, is approved by the, uh, or, or uh, actually this is the application that they can demonstrate its functionality and operability to the T Hub. Um, B4 is, uh, and this is a good place for that discussion uh, for Mr. Chair that you asked about earlier. Uh, proof the applicant for dispatch services of residents of the United States. Uh, dispatch Center for Communications is located in the United States and that it has at least a physical office location with regular business hours in the municipality. Yeah, uh, and so this, you know, we'll probably end up working more with dispatch uh, companies and the industry more broadly on this point. Um, but I believe their, their point is that, you know, a, a, a dispatch center uh, could technically exist outside of the uh, outside of Alaska and provide services, even if it, you know, especially if it was some kind of digital platform. And this is allowing them to do that. However, they have to have some kind of to, to be a licensed dispatch company in Anchorage. They have to have some kind of office here, and so we're trying to um, trying to service both of those requirements. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, is this uh, the direction that the industry is headed? To where we're going to have large dispatch centers, uh, you know, that are not located in the city where the service is being provided. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. This is something a conversation had with the dispatch companies. I think that they hopefully will speak more to it, um, and we'll get some emails from people in that industry about this. Um, but yeah, preliminary discussions at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I, I guess my. My desire is to give them flexibility uh, so it could go either way. If it makes more sense to have somebody here in, in Anchorage, uh, then that, if that provides a higher quality service at a lower price, then I'm fine with doing that. If there's some alternative, then that's fine too. Okay. You have, have to be able to get your hands on somebody though, should, should there need to be a well, phys I, physical purpose. Well, I mean, I guess that, that's kind of with, if the municipality needs to in some way enforce something on the dispatch company. That's why I wanted to maintain some kind of physical office in the city. Whoever owns the company, you know, they have to have some kind of office here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, we can work on the language a little more if needed. Yeah. Uh, so on page 24, uh, there's a little change to subsection C in line 21. It's not just the sale of controlled substances, it's illegal sales. Um, section 114030, the license transfer, uh, there's a phrase taken out in subsection B, line 39, and that's um, showing the bill of sale if a uh, dispatch license is transferred. Um, it states the specific consideration price paid. So, uh, let's see. The next section, 114040, at the top of page 25, section B. Um, this change is uh, about the in internal rules that are prescribed by a dispatch service. Uh, I think this is just to make language a little more user friendly and a little more. Uh, Well, uh, we'll update it to actually, I guess, what is 
current practice and procedures. Uh, it also accommodates the suspending and idling the tax cab vehicle month to month. So a dispatch company can't disagree with that if a permit owner decides to do so. Uh, it also is where I inserted the reasonable notice for idling the vehicle. Uh, not more than 21, not less than five days notice to the uh, dispatch service MTR prior to the next calendar month where the permit's going to be idled. Um, uh, and then a lot of the deleted language here, I think, just gets, I guess, the municipality out of regulating uh, that relationship between permitting chauffeur and dispatch service. Uh, subsection E in line 35, still on page 25, it takes out the language about uh, merger between dispatch companies. Um, it doesn't require, or deleting the requirements to submit a plan, merger, and so forth. Um, the change to subsection F, it's basically a modernizing language there, tracking the location in real time rather than just radio transmissions. Um, let's see. Page 26, we're at 11.40.50. Uh, every dispatch service will be able to provide service throughout the municipality and have at least one business location with regular business hours within the municipality. Uh, we touched on that earlier. Uh, changes here to subsection B. Uh, these are deletions of language that was requested by the industry, I believe. So it's, I think, just modernizing in that section. Okay, uh, page 27, the communication between uh, dispatchers and chauffeurs. And here it's uh, similar to what I touched on earlier. It reorganizes the section a little bit, so the dispatch system has to be either two-way radio communication or computerized GPS-based dispatch. Uh, and then, in addition, subsection B, you can supplement that with the digital dispatch app. Uh, page 28, we're repealing two sections, 1140-54, standardized training certification, that's training for the dispatchers and um, we're leaving that up to the dispatch service companies. And then, yeah. uh, uh, 11.40.57, we're leaving that. We start, we'll start okay. a little late, so we'll keep going for five, 10 minutes. We'll to go okay, I'll try to wrap oh, up quickly okay. here. Uh, we're letting the FCC grease their own requirements instead of leaving 11.40.57. Uh, page 29, uh, there's some deletions to requirements for dispatch service records at the top of 29. Uh, basically, just make it a little less onerous as to what must be recorded. And subsection D at the bottom is uh, changes the uh, frequency of submitting dispatch records. Uh, currently, they're uh, annually at license renewal or uh, periodically, the last sentence being deleted to subsection D, a monthly or other periodic basis. So we're changing that here to um, good cause. And well, this language is a little rough. The transportation inspector can request records for good cause. And there's some examples of what good cause is, leaving it open for other good cause. And uh, requiring them twice per year, uh, uh, annual renewal and six months after. And I guess that might affect how Mr. Messer's office tracks what's happening in the industry. Um, see, the dispatch service rates, uh, 114070 at the bottom of page 29. Um, whoops. So page 29 at the bottom, and then page 30, there's a bunch of changes to these three sections. I'm deleting section 114090 in um, kind of combining language and changes to 11, 40, 70, and 80. It's not intended to change substantively how establishing um, dispatch service rates and the taxi cab fare rates are set by the dispatch service. It's just reorganizing those three sections because they're confusing the way they were written, in my opinion. 
So I just reorganized it without trying to change substantively what they can do. Dispatch service companies can still set up the tax cut fair rates that their subscribing permanent owners are supposed to charge for fares. And again, we're, uh, there's a maximum rate, right, for flag drop fares. But the dispatch service company, you know, without a maximum, can set other fares that are procured by the dispatch to do dispatch app or otherwise. And so those are established by the dispatch service companies and tunnel rules. And then there's the uh, subscription rates for the permit to subscribe to the dispatch service company. And that's not intended to change substantively, it just clarifies uh, how that's done. And so uh, now moving on to regulations for the uh, Transportation Commission was able to set different uh, fees and fares and so forth. And there's a few changes here. Um, uh, it's subsection 11.10.09 for the regulations. Uh, we're just being consistent with the removal of the commission setting maximum fares. So uh, A1 at the top of 31 is deleted, so we're not regulating uh, the maximum amount charged when a fare is based on time. Subtraction two is changed to its curbside service only, but three dollar flag drop, thirty cents per tenth mile. So that stays in place for only curbside service. And then uh, the other changes are consistent to what I touched on earlier. But at the bottom of page thirty one, we're changing the permit fee. It was recently changed a uh, month and a half or so ago to uh, one thousand seven hundred dollars, and this is lowering it to what it used to be last year um, before we had other changes to Title 11. Uh, so rolling it back to 1425 per year. I think I have a typo. That 1425 is supposed to be a common out of period, so it's another dollar for 25. Um, top of page 32, it's basically half that amount for permits that are uh, operated um, issued after July 1 or operated on a seasonal basis. And that's the end of our document. So. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gates. So I'll, I'll just say some concluding remarks uh, because we're out of time. Um, so I apologize to those who didn't get to speak. We're going to have more hearings on this. Um, I also apologize that you just got it today. I just got the final version today, too. I was working on it last night. Uh, Mr. Gates is the attorney for the entire assembly, and he's been doing a lot of work on the budget and on the fuel tax and on a bunch of different stuff uh, driven by the whole assembly. So um, I'm, glad, I'm glad he was able to finally get this done. Uh, for those that just got it, I, I really encourage people to read through it and, and think about it and then send emails to myself and to um, other people on the assembly. Uh, again, though, this, this is the first draft. Um, we're going to work on this over the course of the next few months. Um, and for my colleagues, uh, I apologize that we have quite a, a bit of work ahead of us on this, I think. And I, I assume that parts of this you'll oppose and parts of it you'll support. Um, and I know Mr. Musser will have a lot of strong thoughts about this too. So um, again, well, this is the beginning of a, of a conversation and I, I just wanna thank you all for, for being here. With that, meeting is adjourned.